Yes, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome to this session, which is organized by the European Central Bank. Uh, I am Helen Ray, professor at London Business School, and we have here a wonderful panelist, uh, very eminent uh, members of the central banking community, international organizations, and, uh, and academia. Um, we are going to discuss an issue which is central to the central banking community and uh, to uh, international finance, uh, as well as to the private sector. Uh, it's low interest rate and, uh, and, and risk taking. And uh, I'm going to uh, now uh, give the floor to our first uh, panelist, who is uh, Isabel Schnabel from uh, the European Central Bank. So Isabel, please, you have 10 minutes. The floor is yours. So thank, thank you very much, Hélène. Good afternoon to, uh, to everybody. It's a great pleasure to be uh, a part of this uh, interesting uh, session on low interest rates. And uh, actually what I want to do today is I, uh, I want uh, to give a brief overview um, uh, of the, uh, the ECB's experience with negative uh, rates. Uh, so sorry, can you please share the screen? <laughs> And so uh, I'm actually in a, in a, a privileged uh, position in the sense that I can uh, draw on all the uh, exciting research that has been done uh, at the ECB uh, on this topic. And uh, as you know, in June 2014, um, the uh, ECB was actually uh, the, the first major central bank uh, to lower one of its key interest rates into negative territory. And at that time, the experience with negative interest rates was scant. So um, the ECB proceeded cautiously, uh, lowering the deposit rate by small steps of 10 uh, basis points uh, to now minus 0.5%. Uh, uh, and uh, while negative interest rates uh, have become a standard uh, instrument in the ECB's toolkit, they still remain controversial, uh, both in central banking circles and in academia. And so in my remarks uh, today, uh, I uh, will have a look at the ECB's experience and I will argue that uh, the transmission of the negative rates has uh, actually worked uh, smoothly and that in combination with our other policy measures, uh, they have been uh, effective uh, in stimulating the economy and in raising uh, inflation. And uh, on balance, uh, it seems that the, these positive effects uh, have exceeded the side effects. And uh, this is in particular true uh, when taking into account the compensating measures that have been taken uh, by the ECB, like the two-tier system of reserves and the targeted longer-term refinancing uh, operations. Uh, at the same time, the side effects are likely to increase over time. And uh, since these negative rates are uh, by and large a reflection of broader adverse macroeconomic uh, trends, uh, the pandemic should also be a wake-up call for governments to foster innovation, foster potential growth, and also reap the benefits uh, from further European uh, integration. Uh, so, of course, um, sorry, this doesn't work, sorry. <laughs> So, uh, uh, of course, um, uh, our policy has to be seen uh, on the backdrop of the macroeconomic developments. And what you see on my first slide uh, is what you know very well, the secular decline in the real equilibrium uh, rate of interest uh, in most advanced economies. And this has, of course, posed major challenges to monetary uh, policy. And uh, so in the, um, uh, in the middle of 2014, uh, when the downside risks to the euro area's inflation outlook intensified, but at the same time, the conventional uh, policy space was uh, exhausted, the governing council uh, decided to adopt uh, negative rates. And the goal was uh, to trigger a repricing of the expected future path of short-term interest rates by breaking through the zero lower bound and at the same time to encourage banks uh, to provide more credit uh, to the uh, economy. Next slide, please. So uh, after uh, the DFR was lowered into negative territory, uh, we can see on the left-hand side that uh, the entire three-month Uriber forward curve uh, actually uh, shifted uh, um, uh, downward and then eventually into negative uh, territory. And it even started to exhibit uh, a slight uh, inversion. So in other words, 
the uh, ECB had actually succeeded in shifting the perceived lower bound on interest rates firmly into negative territory. And that was also supported by our forward guidance, which uh, left the door open for the possibility of future rate cuts. So um, in a sense, the zero lower bound was no longer constraining market expectations. But of course, the effect of this uh, exceeded, uh, extended well beyond the uh, short-term rates. Uh, so as you can see on the right-hand side, uh, the negative interest rate uh, policy actually uh, contributed to shifting uh, the, um, the euro area sovereign yields downward across the full maturity, uh, maturity spectrum uh, with the peak uh, around the five-year segment. And uh, these effects were reinforced by a compression of the term premium. So uh, the negative rates strengthened the incentives of the investors to rebalance their portfolios towards longer dated securities. And uh, basically for the same reason, the negative interest rates also strengthened the portfolio rebalancing channels of asset purchases. And uh, so this uh, effect that is sometimes called the hot potato effect also uh, extended to uh, bank loans, which uh, picked up with the start of the negative rates, as you can see on the next slide. Um, and in fact, of course, this is not necessarily a causal effect, but there are uh, quite a few studies um, uh, which have confirmed uh, that the uh, negative rates had a causal impact on loan growth. Uh, so what you can see on the right hand side is uh, that the actual loan growth uh, was uh, well uh, above the vast majority of counterfactual scenarios of non-negative policy rates. So taken together, these findings uh, suggest that uh, the lowering of policy rates into negative uh, territory fostered uh, monetary policy transmission in the euro area. Nevertheless, uh, the negative rates have, of course, often been criticized for um, potential side effects, and in particular uh, regarding the banking sector. So uh, we, we know that banks are reluctant to pass on the negative uh, rates to their retail clients, and uh, that implies that the funding costs typically do not drop uh, in tandem with the decline in the lending rates, which then uh, tends to depress banks' interest margins uh, and hence uh, their uh, profitability. Next slide, please. Um, and so uh, there are studies that uh, document uh, that a surprise hike in the policy rate uh, has a negative effect on bank stock prices in normal times, but it has a positive effect uh, in an environment of negative rates, as you can see on the right hand side. And this effect is actually increasing uh, in uh, the deposit uh, ratio. So uh, uh, when you're thinking about a lowering of interest rates, that would actually have a negative uh, effect on bank uh, equity values. So in the extreme, uh, central banks could uh, reach what has been called the reversal rate at which an additional policy cut would become uh, contractionary. And uh, we could, one could say that in essence, the zero lower bound has been replaced by an effective lower bound, uh, which of course also depends uh, on the economic agent's willingness to switch uh, into uh, cash. Uh, current estimates uh, at the ECB suggest that the ECB has not reached uh, this effective lower bound. Next slide, please. So yet um, there is a clear uh, evidence uh, of the negligible path through of negative policy rates to banks' retail uh, deposit rates, as you can see on, on this slide. Um, and uh, please, next slide. Uh, however, uh, we see that there is a growing proportion of deposits held by non-financial corporations that is remunerated at uh, negative rates. Um, interest rate uh, margins, uh, uh, of course, are only one part of uh, banks' uh, profitability. Um, the, uh, the negative interest rate policy, of course, works by stimulating aggregate uh, demand. And uh, since the negative rates contributed to an improvement of the macroeconomic outlook, they also had a positive effect on credit uh, quality. Next chart, please. And uh, as a result, um, uh, uh, if we actually look at the overall effect of negative rates on bank profitability, uh, our analyses show that this overall effect uh, was uh, negligible. And the reason is uh, that the negative effects that I mentioned before were broadly compensated by the reduction in the loan loss uh, provisions. 
And in addition, there were, of course, these additional measures like the Tourtier system and the Teltros, which contributed directly to mitigating the impact uh, of the negative rates on bank uh, profitability. Next slide, please. Um, the, the second concern is uh, the effect of the negative uh, policy rate, uh, rates on banks' risk-taking. And there are, of course, many studies that have looked at the risk-taking behavior of banks in a low-interest uh, environment. On the left-hand side, you, you see a chart from a very nice paper by uh, Haida, Saidi, and Shapens, who show that the introduction of the negative uh, policy rates by the ECB uh, induced the high deposit uh, banks who would be um, more strongly affected to incur higher uh, lending risk than the low uh, deposit banks. And uh, in a very similar vein, uh, Bubek, Madaloni, and uh, Pedro show, and this shown on the right hand side, that there's a very similar uh, effect uh, on banks' uh, investment choices in their securities uh, portfolios. Uh, there's another paper by uh, Bitna and co-authors uh, co who actually consider the real effect of, of all of this. And so what they uh, show, and uh, I, I find that very interesting, is that the borrowers of the high deposit banks are riskier, but they also increase investment and employment more strongly after receiving loans. And this then uh, supports the monetary transmission to the real economy. And it is precisely through these type of effects that higher risk taking by banks may actually uh, be a feature rather than a bug, as long as it does not pose a financial stability concerns. Let me at the end take a somewhat more longer term uh, perspective. Next slide, please. Um, so a persistent period of uh, negative rates may of course pose additional challenges. So uh, on the left-hand side, you see a, a, a graph uh, from a paper by uh, Jorge et al, uh, which is analyzing historical pandemics. And uh, this shows that pandemics uh, were typically followed by a long period of depressed economic growth and also a sustained drop in the uh, real natural rate of uh, interest. And this um, uh, implies that uh, in the absence of a forceful policy uh, response, uh, the pandemic is likely to put substantial pressure on banks' profitability uh, because we have to expect rising loan loss provisions uh, and defaults. And this is, this is happening at a time when euro area banks' profitability is already depressed, as can be seen uh, on the right-hand side. And this relatively low level of profitability uh, is mostly caused by structural reasons and has um, been around for quite some time. The solution uh, to these underlying structural courses go um, beyond the uh, remit of monetary uh, policy. So this includes all these topics like overbanking, a lack of pan-European mergers, uh, and so on. And these problems uh, would require um, uh, things like the completion of banking union and advancement of capital markets union. And these, in fact, have become much more important after the uh, pandemic. And when we think about the medium to long-term growth outlook, this will depend crucially on uh, whether the public spending at the national level and also at European level is uh, used wisely in order to foster the euro area's growth potential. And this then leads me to my concluding slide. And I would like to stress uh, three points, which you can see on, on this slide. So the first is that the ECB's negative interest rate uh, policy has been successful in turning the zero lower bound into an effective lower bound well below zero and in supporting bank lending. And this has fundamentally uh, improved monetary transmission and helped to stimulate the economy and raise inflation. Uh, uh, but of course, the negative uh, rates can have side effects on uh, banks' profitability and risk-taking behavior. The experience from the euro area shows that the uh, positive effects have dominated um, and that was also supported uh, by these uh, complementary measures that I mentioned. Uh, and finally, uh, it may happen that the side effects become more relevant uh, over uh, time. And uh, this, is, uh, this is what makes a forceful policy response by governments uh, so important uh, in order to raise um, potential growth. And this actually may then um, even pave the way for positive interest rates uh, in the future. And this is where I want to stop. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, 
Isabel for this wonderfully clear and extremely well documented uh, discussion, which opens up a lot of avenues uh, for, for question and discussion down the road. Uh, now we are going to take a view from the International Monetary Fund. Uh, Tobias, uh, the floor is yours. Thanks so much. Uh, very good uh, to see you all and uh, thanks for having me in this interesting session. So I'm going to talk uh, about uh, forward guidance. So it's uh, very much complementary to what Isabel was talking about. Uh, so I hope you can see my slides now. So, uh, so the title of my presentation is on monetary policy, low interest rates and risk taking. So uh, uh, Isabel showed lots of uh, micro evidence and I'm gonna focus more on a, on a bit of a macro approach. Um, so my motivation uh, is a set of stylized facts uh, that I've been working on over the past couple of years with various co-authors, both at the International Monetary Fund and at the Federal Reserve. And so the stylized facts are that when you look at uh, the output gap distribution, here I'm showing the US output gap uh, changes uh, since the 1970s, uh, together with upside and downside risk. So these are the quantiles, the fifth and the 95th uh, uh, quantile. And what you can see is that this output gap distribution is very asymmetrical. Uh, so there's lots of downside risk, uh, but there's uh, a limited amount of upside risk. The upper quantile is very constant while, while the lower quantile is moving around a lot. And uh, basically what is happening is that uh, when uh, financial conditions are easy, uh, you have positive growth, uh, but you don't have the risk that suddenly output gaps uh, become hugely positive. Uh, they're sort of like, you know, you're chucking along at the, uh, at the potential uh, rate of growth. Uh, but of course, in crisis times, there's massive contraction. And so when financial conditions tighten, basically what happens is that uh, uh, downside risk realizes. And so the right-hand chart shows you that the conditional mean and the conditional volatility of changes in the output gap are strongly negatively correlated. So in boom times, you have high growth and low volatility. So it's like, it's like the opposite of risk return trade-off, right? Uh, in, in, in boom times, volatility is low and growth is high. And then in busts, growth is low and volatility is high. And so the state variable uh, to understand this is really financial conditions. And, um, you know, I, I think when I think about modeling, uh, the way I want to translate financial conditions is, is as the price of risk of the economy. So this is basically the, the volatility of output is the price of risk of the economy. That's a very generic uh, uh, result in, in, in any uh, macro model. Um, and so there's this negative relationship. So this is one important feature um, and uh, so when I think about sort of like a parsimonious macro model to capture these things, I want to think of a new Keynesian model uh, with uh, an aggregate demand curve, which is uh, uh, the Euler equation, an aggregate supply curve, which is the Phillips curve, an interest rate rule, but then in, the, in addition, this endogenous price of risk uh, or financial conditions equation that basically links to the volatility of output gaps uh, but there's also an accelerator term, a la Goethe, Gilchrist, um, and so uh, basically this has an impact on second moments, but also on first moments. So the second uh, stylized fact that is very important is that there's a kind of volatility paradox in the data. So when financial conditions are very easy, in the short term that is forecasting uh, high growth and low volatility, but over the medium term, the signs revert for volatility. So basically over the medium term, very easy financial conditions today forecast uh, high output uh, volatility down the road or downside risk. Easy financial conditions tend to be uh, followed uh, by uh, periods of turbulence down the road. So this is a kind of volatility paradox in that um, you know, good times turn bad eventually. And that's a very strong feature in the data. That's true for individual countries uh, like the US or it's true for the Eurozone. And we showed it for advanced economies, for emerging markets, it's a very robust finding. So this is like this volatility reversal. So now I, I calibrate such a, such a reduced form new Keynesian model that has this one additional equation, which is the additional equation for the price of risk. And again, the price of risk enters the IS curve in terms of heteroskedasticity, 
So the volatility of output gaps is proportional to the price of risk. Uh, but also there's an accelerator term. So think of the price of risk as like a credit spread or so. And so now I want to think about forward guidance. Here I use zero at the effective lower bound, but of course, uh, as Isabel pointed out, the effective lower bound could be lower. It could be at minus 0.5, minus one, or, or any, any, anywhere. So let's say you are at the effective lower bound, and then you provide forward guidance. So the different colors in these charts correspond to uh, different horizons of forward guidance. Say your forward guidance for one year, two year, three year or so. And the first two plots on top, the output gap and the inflation shows you that forward guidance is extremely powerful in these new Keynesian models. Um, right, so output gaps are boosted tremendously, in particular when you go to the three-year horizon in terms of forward guidance. But there's a side effect, and this is the key novel finding relative to the benchmarks sort of like Jordi Gali's textbook uh, or, or, or Mike Woodford's textbook. So the key uh, addition here is that financial conditions are endogenous, right? So very easy, very, very powerful forward guidance for three years also eases financial conditions in the setup, right? Because you have, uh, you, you know, you have a, a boom, more and more of a boom, and so financial conditions get easier and easier. And you can see uh, this goes out three, four, five years uh, or so, depending on how long the forward guidance is. But then there's the reversal. Basically, the easier you have this low for long, the worse is the reversal down the road. And you see the reversal here uh, very, very sharply, in particular at the two year and three year forward guidance horizon. And so, of course, then you can ask, well, shouldn't you take into account in the policy rule that uh, there is uh, this buildup of this endogenous buildup of risk? And yes, the, here I show you on the left the same chart that I just showed you. So, this is the financial conditions, endogenous, not taking uh, the financial conditions into account in the policy rule. Uh, so this would be sort of like you are in a world where risk taking is endogenous, but you're using the Keynesian model without endogenous risk taking. This is what generates the left chart, while the right hand chart takes uh, the endogeneity of financial conditions into account. And then uh, basically the optimal policy is much less pronounced, right? So it's taking into account that you have this boom and bust cycle. So you want to reduce that and you see that financial conditions on the right hand side under the optimal policy that takes financial conditions into account, you know, has less of a boom and bust cycle. But of course, there's a trade-off because of course, at that point, so here I show the output gap on the left chart under the classic New Keynesian rule and the right chart under the uh, optimal rule that takes uh, financial conditions into account. So now you can see that, you know, output gaps are boosted much more uh, when you don't take the endogenous buildup of risk into account. But of course, once you take the endogenous buildup of risk into account, then you, then you worry about the, the buildup of risk, and then you're much less aggressive in terms of your follow other guidance, and hence you boast output much less. So there's a clear like, risk return trade-off here for policymakers. And uh, you know, in order to, uh, in order to uh, 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 finish uh, my uh, intervention here, uh, let me just, uh, you know, raise uh, the following question. So the traditional policy advice of the IMF and uh, in central banks around the world is to then say, well, but there's another tool, there's macro financial policy, right? I mean, so you use monetary policy to target macro, uh, macro outcomes, and you use monetary policy to deal with these financial imbalances. And then it's fine, you don't have to worry. There's some sort of like separation and you don't have to worry, right? And of course, in, in the world that I'm painting, it's a little bit more complicated. I mean, of course, macro potential policy does help you, but it does also limit the degree of monetary policy transmission because of course, by, by uh, regulating more, you're gonna have less risk taking and you're gonna have less impact uh, on uh, on output on macro on macro outcomes, and so that so like feeds into what we call at the IMF the integrated policy framework, where you don't uh, sort of like uh, imagine that there's this strict separation between monetary uh, and financial stability, but it's something that you have to uh, uh, look at jointly and to basically have to jointly determine how to conduct monetary policy and financial stability policies in order to trade off first and second moments. So I think this is uh, where I'm going to stop and turn back to Ellen. 
Thank you very much, Tobias, for introducing this new framework in uh, Philips Curve. Uh, a lot of food for, for thoughts here as well. And uh, now we are going to get the view from uh, Madrid uh, and uh, Semki. Rafael is the third speaker. Okay, so let me um, upload my presentation. Uh, I hope that you see that. Okay, uh, is it in your screens? Yes. Okay. Okay, so let me uh, uh, start. I'm going to be talking about the risk-taking channel of monetary policy, which seems like the topic of this uh, panel, adding one twist, which is uh, this uh, role of uh, market power in the direction of the channel. Now, uh, a little bit of history, the risk-taking channel term was coined by uh, Claudio Borio uh, at the BIS, uh, and basically he was noting this uh, link, uh, potential link between monetary policy and the perception and pricing of risk by economic agents, which we call the risk-taking channel. Now, of course, uh, some people had uh, noted this uh, connection before, and uh, in particular, Raghu Rajan in his uh, Jackson Hall 2005 uh, 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 contribution, has financial development made the world riskier, had this uh, sort of uh, sentence uh, linking an environment of low interest rates with the incentives of some participants to search for yield, and then uh, creating these uh, conditions for a sharp, what you call a sharp and messy realignment. Now, uh, subsequently, there is also this, uh, uh, the secular stagnation paper by Larry Summers, in which he also made the connection between low real interest rates, increase in risk seeking by investors, and increased uh, financial instability. So um, the question that I would like to, first question that I would like to pose uh, today is how do interest rates affect financial stability? Now, if you look at the uh, literature, uh, the empirical literature in particular has uh, uh, shown that uh, there are many papers on this that lax monetary conditions are linked to uh, increased risk taking, especially when rates are kept too low for too long. I decided not to put any references here because there are just too many. Now, on the theory side, there aren't so many papers. Uh, I have a paper with David Martinez Mira, in which basically uh, we show that in competitive settings, the empirical prediction really uh, obtains, right? The question that uh, I would like to focus today is what happens when banks have market power, which seems like a very realistic uh, uh, assumption and one that has been explored in the recent literature by a number of people. Now, if again you look at uh, the theory, uh, and I have a, a recent paper with again my same co-author, is uh, we show that when banks have significant market power, risk-taking channel of monetary policy reverses sign. So instead of uh, low rates uh, leading to higher risk-taking, in fact, low rates are, are going to be leading to lower risk-taking. And why is this? Uh, let me just show you a summary of the results in this paper. Now, uh, what we show is that market structure shapes the effect of safe rates on financial stability. In particular, with high competition, low rates imply riskier banks, but with low competition, low rates imply safer banks. Uh, also, the results, uh, not very surprisingly, are consistent with the traditional charter value hypothesis, in which competition always increases uh, bank risk taking, reduces charter values, and increases bank risk taking. Let me give you an illustration of this result using some pictures from that paper. Now, I'm going to be denoting on the horizontal axis S, uh, R0 as the safe interest rate, the proxy for the stance of monetary policy. On the vertical axis, the probability of loan default, which is a measure of risk taking, and N is going to be the number of banks, the measure of competition. Now, uh, this is the picture that summarizes the result. Here is R0, the safe rate. So low rates are going to the left. The probability of default high risk is going up here. And the different lines in different colors uh, denote what happens in this uh, illustrative example for different number of banks. The dark blue is N equals one, the monopoly case. And as you increase the number of banks, you can see that the slope turns from positive uh, when you have monopoly or a high degree of market power to negative slope in competitive environments. Another thing that uh, you can see here is that uh, in competitive environments for the givens for the same level of the uh, interest rate, you're going to have higher uh, risk taking, lower charter values, higher risk taking. Okay, so let me just give you uh, one slide on what's the uh, uh, model set up uh, that leads to these results. This is a model in which banks compete a la Cournot in a loan market with a given exogenous loan demand function. Banks uh, raise funds from uninsured risk neutral investors, so here deposit insurance doesn't play any role. 
investors require a return R0, which is the safe interest rate, the proxy for the stance of monetary policy. And these banks are going to be monitoring borrowers. Uh, monitoring is going to reduce the probability of default. Uh, it's costly and observed, so there is a moral hazard. This is the key informational friction that uh, uh, we have in the model. So what about market power? Well, uh, safe rates are going to have an impact on banks' funding costs. This is going to have an impact on loan rates and intermediation margins, and therefore uh, monitoring linked to intermediation margins is going to change the probability of loan default. Why is competition relevant? Well, because it affects the pass-through of funding costs to loan rates. In particular, in competitive loan, mar loan markets, the pass-through is strong. Low rates imply lower margins and riskier banks. In monopolistic markets, on the other hand, long, uh, um, uh, markets, uh, the, the, the pass-through is weak. So uh, low rates imply higher margins and therefore higher monitoring, safer banks. Now, uh, just give you the intuition, think of a monopoly. I mean, forget about banks uh, facing a given demand function. When the marginal cost uh, uh, goes down, the monopoly is going to increase sales and margins. Uh, and uh, uh, going back to the banking uh, setup, uh, these higher margins imply higher monitoring, lower risk taking incentives. So, so I mean, that's, that's the very simple explanation for why you have this sort of reversal uh, of the traditional uh, relationship when uh, banks have significant market power. Now, uh, just to uh, link my presentation with what uh, Isabel uh, was uh, discussing, what happens when we have negative rates? Well, negative rates become relevant when there is a zero lower bound on the positive rates, uh, leading to lower bank profitability, leading to tightening capital constraints. This is, of course, the well-known uh, reversal interest rate in the paper by Brunemeyer and Colby. Now, uh, just one slide of comments on this uh, paper. Uh, lower safe rates have uh, positive effects on profits from lending. This is something that sometimes is overlooked. I mean, uh, it's, it's like in the uh, monopolist case, the cost of your funding goes down. If you don't have any deposit taking, you're basically a bank uh, granting loans. This is going to have, uh, uh, this is going to be very good for you because it lowers the cost of your funding uh, without any negative side effects. On the other hand, uh, if you are basically a deposit taking institution uh, lending uh, these uh, funds in the interbank market, this is going to have a negative impact on your profits because the deposit rate cannot go negative given uh, this. Uh, reluctance of uh, depositors to accept a negative risk, at least uh, uh, retail and not uh, corporations. Now, so, so you can see from here uh, that the overall effect is in principle ambiguous, right? Uh, which means really that the reversal rate may not exist. I mean, you may have, uh, or you may have to go to really low interest rates that uh, uh, may not be feasible for other reasons rather than the impact on lending. And it very much depends on the structure of the balance sheet. Uh, in particular, uh, this uh, leads to this, uh, something that Helen is going to like, I believe, uh, heterogeneous effects on monetary policy. The reversal rate uh, is only relevant or may only be relevant for high deposit banks, which is very much in line with uh, the evidence that uh, in this paper by Heider et al. that uh, Isabel also referred in her uh, presentation. What about the risk-taking channel? I mean, going back to the original, uh, let me just give you what I believe is a plausible conjecture. Now, if uh, you think of a bank that is uh, high deposits, uh, you get to the reversal rate. Uh, uh, at that point, the capital constraint is binding. Margins uh, at that point uh, are kept constant by the reduction in lending uh, and uh, no effect of risk taking incentives to the extent that margins are kept constant. So my conjecture is that below the reversal rate, you don't have uh, anything that uh, to worry about in terms of uh, risk taking. But of course, this is a conjecture. I have not uh, proved that this is indeed the case. So let me just uh, conclude. There is a large literature on the risk taking channel of monetary policy. Uh, Tobias uh, has some papers on this uh, in particular. There is an even larger literature on bank competition and risk taking. Not many papers on the intersection of the two. I think that this is an important issue for policy, uh, not just monetary policy, in thinking about what Tobias was uh, mentioning, the connection between monetary and macro potential policy. Uh, the issue of market power is especially relevant given uh, recent increases in concentration in the financial system. Uh, it, is, uh, it is something that lends itself to uh, very nice empirical testing. And uh, I believe that more work, both theoretical and empirical, should be done along these lines. Okay, so thank you very much. And I will stop my sharing. I think I've been within my 10 minutes. Thank you very much, Rafael. And thank you for the uh, 
mention of heterogeneous effects, uh, which are <laughs> close to my heart and financial intermediation indeed. Um, so now I would like to, um, first of all, tell all participants to this webinar that if they want to ask questions, uh, they are very welcome to, uh, to do that in the Q&A section and that uh, we will pick up these questions and put it to the panelists. Uh, but so while we are thinking about your questions, I'm uh, going to turn back to our, our, our three speakers here. And uh, first of all, I'm going to ask a, a very short question to all to the three speakers, but also uh, we'll of course allow them to react uh, to one another uh, and uh, to emphasize whichever points uh, they would uh, they, they want to. So my first very uh, short question uh, to, uh, to 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 Isabel uh, is that. Um, uh, so she, uh, you, you showed Isabel this, um, this graph of uh, uh, decline in natural rate uh, after the pandemic, uh, taken from um, uh, some recent um, empirical work on, the, on, on those matters. But we know that before the pandemic struck, uh, the natural rate was uh, going down. Uh, and um, so I, I would like to, uh, to have your views on what you think are the, the forces uh, driving that, uh, how much you think they are indeed going to be amplified by the pandemic, uh, and whether you, uh, you see uh, any change in direction uh, due possibly to uh, uh, the large change in macroeconomic policies on the fiscal sides um, that, uh, that are uh, uh, enacted in a number of countries and, uh, and in Europe. Uh, so, um, to, um, to Tobias, I was wondering, uh, looking at your uh, trade-off, uh, your new trade-off, how this new trade-off is being affected in a world in which there is a lot of legacy debt. And uh, so, in which, uh, you know, a uh, low rate also means, uh, uh, to some extent, Keteris uh, Paribus, more sustainability. Um, so, um, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that. And to, to Rafa, uh, so uh, you mentioned uh, so the effect on uh, uh, competition, on, uh, on uh, risk taking, uh, but you, you focus mainly on competition on the loan side. And uh, so what about on the deposit taking side and in particular the effect of uh, competition on uh, passing on uh, negative rates to, to customers? Uh, is that something you had, uh, you had looked at? Now you are free not to answer my question, but to uh, react instead. <laughs> To, to each other or to emphasize whichever point you would like to emphasize. Uh, so uh, let, let us start maybe then by, by Isabel, if it's okay with you. Yes, so, so thank you very much for your for your question. You're of course perfectly right and uh, uh, that was also very visible in the in the graph that I showed in the very beginning that uh, it is long-term trend, downward trend in, in natural rates and I mean there uh, uh, I mean, it's clear that this is uh, uh, related to like broad uh, underlying macroeconomic trends uh, related possibly to the um, to demographic factors, uh, to the slowdown in, in, in productivity um, uh, and so on. And uh, many of these forces uh, are still there. So they, they have not kind of died out. But the danger, as you also mentioned, uh, is that uh, actually uh, there may be a, a further amplification uh, of this uh, through the pandemic. But I would say this is um, by no means automatic, but um, it depends very much on the economic policy response and uh, especially, uh, I would say, on uh, fiscal uh, policy. And this is, uh, by the way, why I also think that the European policy uh, response is uh, so absolutely uh, crucial because that may be a way to, uh, to foster potential uh, uh, growth and uh, to, uh, I mean, to um, foster the green transition, the transition to a, a digitalized economy and so on, to raise productivity and thereby um, um, possibly even reverse the trend in the uh, natural uh, rate. So uh, I really think that we should not take these results by Jorge et al as, as given, but they really depend on the policy response. Um, this actually also leads me to one question that I had to uh, to uh, Tobias. I mean, there uh, there is this uh, argument that, especially in the crisis like like the current one, uh, what we really want to avoid is an um, an excessive scarring of the uh, economy, and this may uh, actually be uh, an argument to uh, to be more active uh, now. And uh, of course, uh, I. I uh, 
perfectly see your point, and I think I also uh, alluded to it in a way in the in the speech uh, that uh, there may be higher risks uh, down the road. And uh, I think even though this is not part of our uh, of our uh, framework, uh, I mean I think implicitly this is how uh, uh, nevertheless taken into account, uh, namely in the sense that. Um, uh, I mean, you, you know that the ECB has been away uh, from its uh, um, uh, inflation aim for quite some time. And uh, the fact that, uh, that also the, the speed of the transition towards the inflation aim is adjusted reflects all these type of, uh, of side effects, uh, um, I, I would say. And uh, on, on Raphael, um, I actually I had uh, 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 the same question as Elan. Uh, I mean, I know how tricky it is to model um, a competition uh, in, in banking, uh, especially uh, simultaneously in the in the loan and the, in the deposit market. Uh, but it, it seems it, it would be worthwhile to uh, uh, to further push this type of research because I think that this could actually change uh, some of the uh, implications. And I mean, if we look at the evidence that is there, uh, uh, my feeling is that most evidence uh, points towards higher risk taking and. So your model seems to suggest that then this means that um, uh, that uh, banking markets are highly uh, highly competitive, and I mean for the euro area that's uh, probably true. Even though of course it also depends on the specific segment that uh, you look at. And let me stop here. Yeah, uh, I think uh, you raised uh, many points, as did Elan. Uh, so the discussion is already very rich and very complex. So. Let me make three points. Uh, the first one about the current crisis and the potential for scarring. I think uh, uh, this, this decline in, in, in our star in response to a crisis that is supposed to be just a temporary shock uh, is really about the degree of scarring uh, as, as, uh, uh, as Isabel has, has alluded to. And uh, there can be scarring in labor markets, in product markets, um, they are, you know, there's already a restructuring going on when you look at uh, the cross-section of performance in, in bond or stock markets, you see huge variance, right? I mean, the index is sort of like flat on the year, but, but you know, tech stocks are up 20%, uh, uh, airlines are down uh, between 20 and 40%, and energy is down 40%, right? I mean, huge cross-sectional dispersion, so they're, they're clearly winners and losers, so there will be massive restructuring uh, within uh, the economy and uh, that can generate scarring which can have persistence effects so so temporary shock can have uh, can generate hysteresis and uh, I, I completely agree again uh, with Isabel that that has to be taken account in the policy response I think uh, the policy response in Europe uh, in the US and many other countries has been very very fast very large and that's exactly the right way to address this problem right because you don't you you, you don't want this you, you want to to limit the degree to which a temporary shock becomes permanent and so massive asset purchases uh massive uh, government credit backstops uh, as well as transfers uh, are exactly the right tools and uh, of course, they don't solve the pandemic, right? I mean, the medical issues have to be sorted out uh, uh, independently, but they do reduce scarring and they make sure that uh, economies are recovering as quickly as possible. And I mean, it is pretty amazing the degree to which these appropriate policies, particularly on the central bank side, but also on the fiscal side, have mitigated macrofinancial uh, adverse feedback loops, right? I mean, when you think about it, back in March, there was certainly a huge potential for a replay of the 2008 crisis with all the adverse feedback loops. And then the massive, massive uh, step in by the ECB, the Fed and, and others, Bank of Canada, you, you know, Bank of England, et cetera, you know, central banks around the world and, uh, and fiscal actions around the world have arrested the adverse feedback loops. I think that is a major lesson from the crisis. It's a huge um, um, success. Now, having said that, scarring will still uh, occur. And so, yes, you do want uh, to generate risk taking. So, you know, risk taking is a many, very important transmission channel of monetary policy. 
So on the one hand, yes, you want to regulate to make sure that there's not excessive risk, but on the other hand, you want credit to grow, right? And so uh, I, we're working on the uh, GFSR update for October. I mean, leverage is going up everywhere, right? And that's an intended consequence. Corporate borrowers are levering up. Sovereigns are levering up. It's all over. And that's, of course, what's supposed to happen. But it shouldn't happen too much. So you want to balance that to some degree. And this is where our thinking at the fund is about an integrated policy framework. So you want to think about monetary policy and financial stability in an integrated fashion to make these trade-offs quantitatively uh, uh, in a consistent manner. So, you know, to answer Alain's question, yes, so that overhang, of course, in extreme circumstances can limit monetary policy actions at some point, right? Because a monetary policy maker and we see this in, in, in low-income countries where fiscal dominance exists, right? Where suddenly the monetary policymaker, it becomes very costly to do the right thing, right? to raise interest rates because of this huge debt overhang problem. Now, I don't think that we're anywhere close to that in, in advanced economies. Uh, as, as a matter of fact, I mean, look at Japan. I mean, Japan went from 100 to 200 to 250% of debt to GDP uh, and uh, there's no indication of, of any of these effects. But these effects do exist. It's just the question, when do they kick in? And I think they do kick in, but we're very far in, say, the euro area or, or, or so uh, from getting there. My final point is about competition. I think Isabel showed this very nice chart, uh, you know, uh, of bank profitability, uh, euro area compared to the Nordic countries compared to uh, the US. And of course, uh, you know, that is tightly linked to the degree of competition across these markets. Uh, you have very concentrated market structures in the Nordic countries. And so, you know, there's more market power. Uh, but from financial stability point of view, that's sort of useful because it's much easier for them to reaccumulate capital after an adverse shock. In the euro area, where you have a huge amount of competition, profitability is very low. And then you basically get to a point where recapitalizing the banking system, so reaccumulating uh, capital might take many, many years. And so that's a, that's a problem. And I think that's exactly why, why uh, 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 you know, people say that, well, perhaps you do have to act more aggressively on, on the structure of the banking system to, to restore profitability. Let me stop here. Okay. Uh... Helen and Isabel asked me about uh, the model is only on competition in the loan side. Uh, in the paper, there is a section on uh, deposit taking side. Uh, the results are essentially the same, but uh, let me tell you that uh, there is no zero lower bound on deposit rates. So adding the zero lower bound entails uh, a significant change, and therefore I don't know what's uh, going to be the result of this uh, exercise. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, remember that the reversal rate story is only concerned about the lending amount, not about the risk taking. And I think that it would be nice to sort of integrate these two things into a framework in which we can say something about the connection between the lending side and the risk taking side. Now, <coughs> sorry. Now, Isabel uh, uh, missed one thing that I thought she was going to say. And let me bring. Um, uh, ben Bernanke's uh, presidential address published earlier this year. Uh, he wrote, central banks can address the reversal rate problem through various devices, such as paying higher rate to banks on a portion of their reserves, steering, as has been done by the Bank of Japan and the ECB. I think that this is an important thing that uh, should be brought into the discussion because the steering is related to the amount of reserves, required reserves, and therefore high deposit banks are going to be more uh, are going to uh, get higher benefit from this type of uh, policy than the uh, low deposit uh, uh, banks. Now, one and I have a, a question uh, on uh, this. Uh, Tobias uh, put this uh, uh, very uh, surprising uh, uh, picture of the negative correlation between the conditional mean and the conditional volatility of the uh, output uh, gap. And I think that I'm, I'm a bit worried about this kind of uh, relation because it sort of suggests that in good times, uh, volatility is low, 
and therefore, uh, if you are in a bubble, you should keep feeding the bees because that's what keeps volatility low. So I think that uh, it is important to think about uh, the vulnerabilities which are uh, uh, introduced when you have uh, uh, positive uh, output gaps and maybe excessive uh, output gap. Right. I'm sure I should stop. Thank, thank you very um, much. So, yeah, so maybe, so Tobias you might, and, and, and Isabel, you might want to, to respond to, to Rafa and also take into account, I think the three of you, we have a, a question by Jonathan Benchimol from the audience, uh, who is uh, essentially asking you to elaborate on the fact that if central bank reacts to uh, financial conditions uh, and, uh, and that, that there may be some perverse effect because of financial markets uh, changing their behavior uh, because of that. And so uh, we might, uh, I'm, I'm extrapolating here, maybe uh, getting into some uh, instability and uh, unstable territory. If there is a, a game of uh, reaction functions between the financial market and, and the central bank. If we were to put uh, uh, financial markets into the reaction function of the central bank as uh, as in the presentation of Tobias. So uh, I, I will leave, uh, so Isabel and Tobias answer uh, Rafa, uh, Rafa and, uh, and maybe elaborate on this point if you, if you care to. Thank you very much. Yeah, so um, I, I thank you, Rafael. That's, of course, uh, something that is, that is uh, worthwhile uh, to discuss. You're perfectly right. I, I, I could have mentioned this type of policies as well. Maybe we leave some time for the, the discussion with the audience as well. So, so um, I think there were uh, three questions. So um, the first is about central bank credibility. So uh, when you know when when you don't have perfect credibility. So in in the presentation that I gave, I assume perfect credibility. When you don't have perfect credibility, everything becomes harder, right? I mean, your life in the central bank becomes very difficult when, when you lose credibility. And at the IMF, we see this uh, all the time. Uh, in, in many countries around the world, there is a very imperfect credibility. Um, and uh, it, 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 it generates an additional uh, trade-off uh, for the policymaker. And, uh, so uh, I have a, a, a new paper on, on the integrated policy framework that explicitly models this um, imperfect credibility as well as endogenous financial conditions. And so our answer basically is that you want to use even more tools. So this is, this is a little bit more in the context of, of open economies. So you know, in order to substitute for the imperfection and credibility, you want to do additional things uh, to interest rate policy, uh, such as FX interventions uh, or other things in order to insulate uh, yourself and focus on domestic uh, uh, objectives. Um, so, you know, uh, the second question was, Elaine, as well as by the audience, you know, when uh, when these uh, financial conditions are endogenous or the price of risk is endogenous, uh, how does that uh, interact endogenously uh, with uh, monetary policy? So wouldn't, wouldn't sort of like uh, risk pricing be endogenously different when uh, monetary policy is conditioning on financial conditions? And uh, my answer here is, is twofold. I mean, yes, of course. I mean, if uh, you know, there's a large literature on uh, the monetary policy put, which is uh, demonstrating number one that uh, there's quite strong evidence that of, of, of a put in the data. So when financial conditions uh, tighten uh, a lot, uh, that uh, leads to uh, more aggressive policy easing than what would have been expected by simply looking at macro aggregates. And uh, that is a causal uh, effect. Uh, and of course, if that such a put exists, then uh, the price of risk going forward should be different in, in magnitude. And you see a little bit of this in the current environment, right? I mean, clearly there has been a massive central bank put uh, in, in March and April and markets are booming. And so what we have now is a disconnect between real activity and, and, and financial uh, valuations, right? I mean, so, we have a sharply lower output path uh, going forward compared to January, yet asset prices in the aggregate are 
even more alienated than in January, right? So there's clearly a disconnect. And what is the disconnect? Well, central banks have provided a massive book. And so that changes the price of risk going forward. So yes, uh, that, is, that is an issue. And then of course, the answer is you want to think about risk taking and how to contain risk taking. So you have to use additional tools. So here again, it's the integrated approach that matters. So uh, you certainly want to provide the, the put in this uh, case, but you also have to deal with the consequences, which mean to contain risk taking by prudential actions. Um, and then uh, I, I think I'll leave it here because I don't want to, I don't want to talk too much. I think there was a third question, but let me pass it back to Anna. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, you want to point back on the question of Rafa, which was on the uh, uh, how you go from a low gap volatility, low volatility environment no. to a high gap, high volatility environment. But we also well. have uh, another question from, uh, while you, you think about that, <laughs> we also have another question from the audience, from Kesha Batarai, who is asking you to elaborate on the uh, similarities between monetary policy and fiscal policy in the zero lower bound environment. So maybe that's, uh, that's for Isabel. Yes, yeah, so uh, thank you very much. So, uh, I mean, of course, in, in, um, if, you, if you look at a model, you can find um, similarities. If you look at the real world, I can tell you monetary policy is very different from, uh, from fiscal policy. So, um, I mean, first of all, of course, the lower bound uh, uh, creates uh, a constraint uh, to, uh, to monetary policy. Uh, uh, but in addition, um, the central bank uh, is, of course, bound by... Uh, by the mandate. And so this mandate prevents us from doing everything that, that uh, fiscal policy uh, uh, could do. And this is exactly the reason why uh, many people thought that kind of the, the first line of defense to this particular crisis uh, was, uh, was fiscal policy. But uh, what we then also uh, saw, and I, I think that was very encouraging, is that there was this uh, complementarity between um, fiscal and monetary uh, policy uh, in, in the crisis. So I, I don't know whether that answers the question, but uh, otherwise you may want to specify it a bit more. Thank you very much, Isabel. I think it does. And Tobias, you have a, you have a couple of minutes before. Yeah. We... So let me just say one thing about fiscal, fiscal and monetary interaction. And um, so this is again taking a, a little bit of a broader perspective across uh, countries uh, in, in the world, right? I mean, so many uh, many countries uh, have limits on fiscal space, and then they say, "Oh, why why can't the central bank buy all this paper, right? And then there's fiscal space. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, I, the key question here is what is the governance of the central bank? And, uh, you know, in the European context, I mean, the ECB is extremely independent. So I have no worry that the, in the, that the ECB is going to do the right thing. If they're inflationary pressures, it's going to do the right thing. It's not going to care about what the fiscal position is. But that's not the case in every country in the world. So you don't have the same degree of monetary independence, central bank independence. And at that point, uh, unconventional monetary policies might be constrained by the degree of lack of independence of the central bank, right? So if the central bank is not <laughs> independent enough, then doing asset purchases might be very dangerous in terms of credibility once you have inflationary pressures, once a bad shock hits, et cetera. Um, Secondly, on, on Rafa's uh, point, um, you know, so what I show in the chart, and this has been uh, uh, um, uh, reproduced in many, many dozens of papers at this point uh, from many countries around the world, including by, by researchers at, uh, at the ECB, uh, uh, many other central banks, uh, many academics. So basically what happens is that in the boom, the price of risk is compressed, credit spreads are tight, volatility is low, and growth is high. In the past, vol goes up, condition volatility goes up a lot, and growth collapses, right? This is the essence of procyclicality. So I think there are two types of microfinations that I've been working on. So one is uh, procyclicality in the sense of procyclicality of the financial system, right? So basically, you lever up in good times, Volatility is endogenously low, but then in bad times, 
wall goes up, you have to delever and economic activity is amplified downwards. So that's sort of like my work with Hyun over many years. And it's fully micro-founded. I also have a fully micro-founded DSG model on that. Another micro-foundation is more about beliefs and optimism. And when sort of like the degree of optimism is endogenous, uh, like think of diagnostic uh, beliefs formation, a la Schleifer, uh, then you can also have an endogenous sort of like boom bust cycle through the fluctuations in optimism. And yes, all of this is inherently unstable. In fact, we show in the paper that once you have this endogenous uh, price of risk, um, you know, uh, quiet times can endogenously generate uh, instability going forward. So very much in, in the spirit of, uh, uh, you know, a boom bust cycle that is endogenous. Thank you very much. Uh, and and uh, so we are going to give uh, last word to uh, Raphael and, uh, and Isabel if they, if they, if they want, and uh, because we are at the end of the time now. I think that uh, we should uh, stop at the time, so I will not uh, continue. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Raphael. Isabel? Yeah, I, I was, would just like to thank the other panelists. It was a great pleasure talking to all of you. Thank you very much. And now it's my job as chair, of course, to also thank uh, the uh, panelists and the organizers for this uh, uh, very uh, enlightening discussion. I, I'm afraid we'll, we'll have to talk about these issues, low, low rates and risk taking for uh, a few more years uh, to come. Uh, and I'm certainly looking forward to, to such discussion and to more academic uh, work on these topics. Thanks to all and have a, have a safe and, and good day. Bye bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.